If you have your Bible, I want you to open it up to Matthew chapter 7. I want to discuss with you probably with regards to the end times and where we're living right now and the, uh, what's going on in the body of Christ, probably one of the more important or most important topics that we can talk about. And this is <clears throat> the gospel, being saved. The number one priority of Jesus. The number one priority of Jesus is that people would be saved and would escape hell for eternity. Priority number one. We're going to put up a ton of scripture. You can write them down if you want to. I, what I would suggest is just watch, look, and maybe jot down just the scriptural reference so you can go back and get it in the video. This morning I want to begin before I read my text. Uh, well, let me, let me read the text and then we'll, we'll put up a couple of verses. We're going to, the first two verses, not now, but yeah, we're going to put up, yeah. We're going to, that's my text, but the next verses after that, so you'll be ready, is Mark 1 and John 3. All right, here we go. Uh, let's read our text, beginning with verse 13, chapter 7. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. <clears throat> Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? <clears throat> and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, may your word be true. And every man, every devil a liar. <clears throat> May the truth, the veracity of these scriptures come now <clears throat> and bear weight in our spirit. And God, may the church hear what your spirit is saying to the church. And I pray that the lost this morning might be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Priority number one, the salvation of men's souls. Mark 138, just look. He said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come. This is written in context, the verses immediately prior to that. Jesus had been ministering <clears throat> in Galilee. He had been casting out devils, healing the sick, opening blinded eyes, opening deaf ears, giving mute their voices back. The next morning when they came to Jesus to continue the miracle healing blessing service, here's what he said. <clears throat> the time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of heaven, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's what he was preaching. Now I want to go to John 3.16. Did I give you that one? Okay, John 3.16, here's what the scripture says. Y'all know it, right? Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Did you hear the purpose in there? Would not perish. Would not perish. The purpose that the son was given was so that we would not perish. Now granted, God comes and God is intimately aware, concerned of, and moving among all of our individual needs. There are people who are sick, broke, busted, and disgusted. There are people that are crying out to God for all sorts of things. Deliverances from addiction, broken families, broken dreams, broken homes. God is intimately aware, concerned, and moving among all those things. But let me, let me explain something to you, okay? If you don't make heaven, all of that is for naught. If you don't go to heaven, all of that is for zero. That gains you nothing. You can die with the best marriage, the best kids, the best house, the most money, 
all the toys and all the success, but when you die, you lose it all. The scripture says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? God is concerned about your soul. Not really concerned as to whether or not you're able to buy milk or bread. Not really concerned as to whether or not you have a job or not. With regards to eternity. I didn't say he was disregarding your needs. But in regards to eternity, the things that you and I are going through right now don't matter at all. What matters is that you are saved, born again. So that when we get to the end of life, no matter how rough the journey is, we know that we have a blessed hope in Christ. A place, a promise of His return, a place, an inheritance reserved. And so all of us are not going to heaven on the same road. All of us are not going to get there on, a, on the street called easy. But we're all going to go there. Now, there is a key word in the gospel that we don't preach and use anymore. This is going to be a key word to the whole message. I want you to hear the message. I want you to go to Mark 1.15 again. Just watch up on the screen. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And here's what we say, believe in the gospel. But what did Jesus say? Repent and what? Repent and believe. If I told you to pull out a quarter, on the front would be the heads, and on the back would be the tails. Do you have two coins? No. One coin, two sides. To believe is to repent, and to repent is to believe. You can't believe without repenting. And repenting leads to faith. So he said, I came to preach the gospel. And the gospel begins with this word, repent. Uh, Matthew 3, 2. Jesus preaching here. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17. For the time, from that time, who began to preach? Come on, say it with me. Jesus began to preach and to say. Everybody read it. I'm going to say it again. Let's do it again. All of us together. From that time, all of us together, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. My number one concern for you is Jesus' number one concern for you, and that is that you not perish. Why is that important? Because in 50 or 60 years from now, if Jesus doesn't come back, in which all of us will step into eternity when Jesus comes back. But if Jesus doesn't come back for 50 or 60 more years, 95% of everyone sitting in this room will be dead. D-E-A to the D. And no, ain't nobody going there healthy. You're going there in a calamity, chaos or broken down and I'm telling you that it doesn't matter how many degrees you have it doesn't matter if you have a house that has a four-car garage it does not matter that you fly a plane or own a plane it does not matter if your children all graduated school with all those summa cum laude and all of that out behind it it doesn't matter because you are D-E-A-D -E it doesn't matter. Somebody else is going to drive your car. Somebody else is going to live in your house. If you die before your wife does, somebody else is going to date her. Grab your hope. Somebody say, oh, I pray for them. Amen. Have her, have her big boy. <laughs> That's what killed me to start with. Now, I'm being facetious. What I'm trying to tell you is it doesn't matter. All of that stuff is superficial. All of it's superficial. The primary concern is eternal life. And here's what the Bible says. That most of all the people that have ever graced this planet, all of the people that are alive today and all of the people that will be born, that most of them will die and come to their senses immediately in an eternity of hell. The scriptures, we just read it. The majority of people who die 
in all of human history will go to hell. That's why salvation is of the primary importance. The prominent thing is that you be born again. Salvation, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. By faith, by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. You, have a, you become a new creation with a new heart. You start living in a new way. You have a new crowd. You have a new love for the things of God. A new despisal of the things that despise God. But look at our scripture now in verses 13 and 14 and know that there is a false gospel that the Bible tells us is permeating, infiltrating, and taking over the church of God. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And somebody help me here. And there are many who go in by it. So listen, the false gospel has a wide gate, a broad way, and a big crowd. The false gospel has a wide gate, a broad way, and a big crowd. But, next verse, because narrow is the gate and difficult, that word difficult in the Greek means confined, meaning that it has parameters, that it has boundaries. It's like a tunnel. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few that find it. All right? You don't have to be a math wizard. But if you have a if you have a a, a mass of people, many means most and few means least. Right? So it's telling us that there's a broad way where most people will go, and there's a narrow way where few people will go. There's an easy way of living where most people are going to go. There's a way that has boundaries that few people will go. And the people that took the easy Broadway, their destination is going to take them to a place that they didn't intend to go. See, they wanted to go to life, but the path that they chose took them to death. So, the narrow way leads to life. When G- in, in Luke 9.23, did I give you that one? I didn't? Okay. Luke 9, 23, here's what Jesus said. If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Almost everyone has a desire. But the paths separate between desire and deny. The path separates between desire and deny. Denial means that there's been a repentance and a true faith in Christ that's willing to go to the death. Let's take up our cross. That's willing to go to the death for Jesus. The broad way desires Jesus and desires eternal life. But the path that they choose does not include a cross. It does not include denial. It does not, it's, it's just a, it's the world's way with a religious title. If I were to say to you, are you a Christian? And you probably would answer me by saying yes. If I were to ask you, how do you know you are a Christian? You would say, because I believe in Jesus Christ. Now I want you to write this down out here beside these these ver- uh, 13 and 14 somewhere in these verses. I want you to write down put a Q and then a colon, that's two dots and then out beside it. I want you to write this. How do I know I believe? 
See, if I said, are you a Christian? You say, yes. I say, how do you, how do you know you're a Christian? I believe. And we leave it there. But there's another question. How do you know you believe? You see, because on this other path, they believe too. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Look this way. How do you know you believe? How do you know you believe? How do you know you're on the right path? Because if you're on the right, wrong path, it's going to the wrong place. So we don't have a subjective faith. We have an objective faith. We don't have a subjective faith. We have an objective faith. I'm going to read a... I don't know why she sent me a text. She's supposed to be in church. William Booth wrote this. He was the founder of the Salvation Army. The chief danger that confronts the coming century. This was written in the 1800s, by the way. He was a prophet. The chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost. Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. Politics without God. And heaven without hell. Friend, listen. We are living in that time. Right now. Now, if you can see politics without God, then you just know that the rest of them are true. That we have Christianity without Christ. That we have forgiveness. Wait, wait. Christianity without Christ? Forgiveness without repentance? Salvation without regeneration? How do you have that? Well, you got a false gospel. You got a wide gate. You got a broad way. You got a lot of people that are in it. Now, their desire is for Christ. And their, their hope is eternal life. But they're on the wrong path. How'd they get there? They're deceived. They don't know. But we don't have a, subject, a, a subjective faith only. Now, see, there's people that says, well, Pastor Ray, I just know. To which I would say, well, how do you know? Because there's a Bible verse, Proverbs 14, 2. Can I give you that one, Sam? Proverbs 14, 2. I didn't? Okay, well, I have it written down. It's always good. Never trust computers, right? Just... There is a... No, that's not it. It might have been 1412, not 142. Listen, there is a way, there is a way that seems right to a man. That's not it, Sam. You can take, you can take that one down. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end of it is death. Your heart can't be trusted. You can't trust your own heart. The scripture, when it tells us to examine ourselves in the faith, it ain't saying just look at your heart. Look at 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. What am I looking for if I'm examining myself? We're going to talk about that in a second. Test yourselves. There are tests. There are scriptural tests. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you are disqualified. In another place, Paul writes it this way. Indeed, unless you have believed in vain. Meaning that there is a vain faith that disqualifies you from heaven. And that is this. That your faith doesn't pass the test. That your faith doesn't pass the test. And so we're going to talk about that. 
If I'm supposed to be looking at something to see if I really be in, in the faith, what would I look at? And you're holding it in your hand or in your lap. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is true. It's true. All right? And so if Jesus says to, um, if Jesus through Paul is telling us to examine ourselves, what he's saying is, is that there's some people who call me Lord, but they have not gone the way of repentance and true faith. There's a false conversion. We'll talk about that in a moment. So here's my three points, if I could just go ahead and say them. All right, you ready? There's a false gospel, a false prophet, and a false conversion. A false gospel, a false prophet, and a false conversion. And so, let's look at the Scriptures. Now, we're going to put them up. We're going to put up the Scriptures, and there's some tests that you can look at. The Bible says that this is a mirror. So when I look at it, who am I looking at? Not my wife. Not my husband, not going like this. You need to read that. No, it was written to you. So quit saying, I hope so-and-so was there. They needed to hear this. Hey, listen. When God speaks, everybody needs to listen. When He speaks, He speaks for eternity, and He speaks to all creation. All the, always, you'll say, well, I don't need to go down there. It's just prayer meeting. Well, it's because we, we meet with God in prayer. And, and there ain't nobody in here. Can I use ain't? Ain't nobody in here don't need to meet with God in prayer. So you need to be at prayer meeting because we're going to meet with God in prayer. And He's coming to meet you. And if you ain't here and you're born again, He's coming looking for you. Believe that. All right, so let's look at some scripture. What are some things the scripture says that we need to look at? Well, a while ago it says, test yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. For indeed, Christ, Jesus, dwells inside of you unless you have believed in vain. So if Christ Jesus dwells inside of me, the scriptures are going to tell me what, what the life of Jesus is going to look like in my life. Galatians 5.22. I know I gave you that one. I didn't. Oh, Lord. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. Love is the first one. You could really say that the rest of them are outflows of love in different scenarios. That love shows itself with meekness. Love shows itself with self-control. Love shows itself through faith. Faith working through love. So the love of God when you are born again is shed abroad in your heart. The love of God is in your heart if you're saved. And that means that you love now. You have the capacity to love and the impetus to love all that God loves. And God says, God, the scripture says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love what? Your neighbor as yourself. The fruit of the Spirit is, first of all, love. Uh, love for Jesus is the first one. Look at 1 John 4, 12 through 16. Did I give you that one? No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. Stop right there. You know, we've been, this country, our country, has been telling you and the false prophets have been telling you and those who believe the false prophets have been telling you that the Muslims and the Christians worship the same God. That verse proves that's not true because the Muslims hate non-Muslims to the point that they will kill you if you don't convert where they rule and reign and to the point where they will kill their own if, you, if they convert to another faith. Here's what it says. If the true God lives in you, you will love one another. Tells you right off the bat, Muslims ain't in it. They're looking for a reason to kill everybody that's not Muslim. There's a false gospel. They sing Kumbaya and say, why can't we be friends? There are people in this city right here 
that invited Muslim clerics to come into their church to explain to the Christian people how we serve the same God. Say it with me. Wide is the wide is the gate and broad is the and where does it go? Destruction. You've got to pay attention, guys. Examine yourself as to whether or not you're being and there's people in that church that let that knuckle hit. Uh, let him do that. They should have called him on the carpet and fired him. Fired him for letting that happen. The Bible says have no fellowship. Okay. I don't want to get too, too far. All right. Not only love for Jesus. Let's go love for Jesus. All right, here we go. God in us. Here we go. Next verse. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, that He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and He who abides in love abides in God and God in Him. The test of the Scriptures... <clears throat> is that you love one another, and that you love God's people, and that you love God's creation, and that while we have differences with Muslims, we don't hate them to the point that we want to kill them if they don't want to believe in Jesus. Right? So that's one of the evidences. Love for the Scriptures, Psalm 119 and 24. Your testimonies also are my delight in my counselors. Do you have a love for God's Word? You have a love for God. Listen, guys, it's not a good sign in your life. I'm just telling you. I'm not saying that you're not saved. It is not a good sign in your life that you call yourself a Christian and you have no desire to read God's Word. That's not a good sign. It, the, the psalmist said, Your testimonies are my delight and my counsel. That the Word of God is loved by you and is given priority of authority. In your life, the word of God is given priority of authority over Fauci, over Kamala, over Joe, if you can find him, all right, over the Pope, over your denominational board, over your eldership, over your deacons, over your preacher over your wife, over your husband, over your children, over any other thing. It is the preeminent authority in your life, period. And if God said it, it's true whether we can understand it or explain it. It's true, not just today, but forever. It always has been, it is. And it will always be the truth of Almighty God. It is not outdated. It can't be voted up. It can't be voted down. It can't be voted out. It's the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. It is the very Word by which God has brought forth all of creation. And He upholds everything and sustains it by His very Word. There's not another word. There's not a, another revelation. There's not new revelation. There's just some old things that man is figuring out, but there ain't nothing new under the sun, says the writer of Ecclesiastes. What has been shall be again, because God changeth not, and His word is eternal. A love for His word. 1 John 2, 3 through 5. Now by this we know. Somebody say we know. We know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Look this way. It is not a good sign in your life if you have no desire to live by God's Word. By every word. It's not a good sign. It's not a good sign if you say, well, that was back then. It doesn't mean anything now. That's not a good sign. It's not a good sign if you say, I believe this, but I don't believe that. That's not a good sign. The scripture says that we live according to his commandments, that we keep his commandments. Next verse. He who says, I know him. That's the broad, that's the wide gate. 
That's the wide gate. This is the broad way right here. He who says, I know him and do not, does not keep his commandments is a liar. He's on the wrong path and doesn't know it. He says, I know him, but then he calls him a liar because the one who says, I know him, does not have a desire for the word of God and does not live by the word of God. Oh, snap, crackle, and pop. It's quiet in here, isn't it? And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God has perfected him. What does that mean? Those who keep his word, the love that God has shed abroad in our heart becomes perfected in the life of him who believes. And by this, somebody say by this. By this we know. By this we know that we are in him. Oh, God help me, preach. All right, go to John 14, 5. There it is. There it is. There it is. Not only do they have a love for Jesus, not only do they have a love for the Scriptures and, and obey them, but they have a love for right living. 1 John 1, 6. If we say, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. What does it mean to walk in darkness? It means to walk in the ways of the world. To walk out of the scriptures. The Bible says that the word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That the entrance of thy word giveth light. So if we say that we have fellowship with God and do not walk in the light of his word, we are a liar! We think we're on the narrow way. We're not. Next verse. Uh, 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he, that's the one they say we believe in, is righteous. You love righteousness. It's not a good sign in your life that you're on the right road if you have no desire to live righteously before the Lord and before the world. It's not a good sign. We become uh, Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. People say, Pastor Randy, I've been saved by grace, not of works, and so they just take that as a license to go live the broad way. And they turn the grace of God into license for loose living. That's not a good sign. They become sensitive to sin. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. Sensitive. If we say, if we say, there it is again, but we, we bump our gums easy, right? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Here's what that means. Everybody in here still sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So not only do we have a sensitivity to the righteousness of God and desire to walk in it, we have a sensitivity to sin and desire to live outside of it, which leads us to repentance. We are supposed to be sensitive to sin to the point that we confess it when we commit it. If you and I can live openly in sin, that we can chase skirts and flirt and live on 4th and 23rd, without any repentance, that's not a good sign for those who have a testimony that they know Jesus. I'm, I'm going to skip First John 3, 16 and 19. I've kind of already go over that. And, and then the last one is that it endures. Uh, Matthew 24, 13.
You have that one? There you go. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who endures to the end shall be saved. I'm going to read a verse. I didn't, I didn't give it to you, Shannon, so, so don't look for it. But I want to read, I want to read something uh, to you guys. And see, there's an exodus out of the church. And when I say an, an exodus out of the church, there's an exodus out of the true church, which is the narrow gate way that preaches narrow gate, narrow gate, confined way that leads to life. There's an exodus out of that church. There's an, there is a mass influx or immigration into the apostate church. And then there's also just the mass exodus out of church in general and people just going out into the world. Those are not good signs. And here's what people say. Well, they used to go to church and that I, I, I'm saved. I just hadn't been to church in a long time. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not questioning your salvation. I'm just telling you that you need to, when you search yourself, you just need to know that this is waving a red flag at you. 1 John 2, 19 says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. God is in the culling business. The Bible says judgment has begun. Back here in, when, in the days when this was written, that judgment has begun at the house of God. And God's culling the church. He's making ready his bride. All right. And so there is a separation process. So all I'm telling you is, I'm not telling you what to do. Here's what I'm telling you. Be careful of where the masses go. Because most people are going to go to hell. Be careful. That's all I say. Be careful. If everybody's going here, be careful. Because many enter in to the broad way. Just saying. I'm not saying every church that's got a big crowd is, is an apostate church. I'm just saying be careful. Be careful. Because when you preach narrow gate, difficult way, few that find it, it means few. It just means few. Few means few. It's not a tricky Greek word. It actually means what it says. Phew. All right? We, need to, we have to have an enduring faith. Faith and works. Should, uh, William Booth, again, I'm quote, I love William Booth. I'm going to quote him. Just listen. Faith and works, that is the fruit of our faith. Faith and works should travel side by side together, step answering to step like the legs of a man walking. First faith, then works then faith again, then works again, until they can scarcely be distinguished between which one is one and which is the other. In other words, the broad way, wide gate, broad way, talks a good game. But the narrow way walks a good game. The broad way talks a good game, but the narrow way walks a good game. So point number two, this will be much faster. False prophets. What do you mean false prophets? Well, let me explain to you. False means not true. Prophet means declaring the word of God. He says, beware, be wary of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly there are ravenous wolves. In other words, the false prophets will shepherd the apostate church. The false prophets will shepherd and propagate the false, the false uh, gospel church. And they're hard to see because they're dressed up like everyone. It says they come to you in sheep's clothing. And Jesus says, my, my sheep hear my voice. So he refers to his true followers as sheep. So he says, if you just look out among the sheep, you won't be able to recognize the false prophet. They look like, they dress like, they carry one of these. They just don't preach all of it. They carry one of these, and they know enough narrow gate words 
to lead you into the wide gate. They know enough truth, in other words, to get you to believe the lie. They are false prophets. You say, well, Pastor Randy, why is it so hard to find them? Well, he goes down here and he says, you will know them by their fruits. The reason we can't see them is because we're biblically illiterate. Never before have we had access to the Word of God like we have now. You have it on your phone, your laptop, your iPad. It's on the radio. It's on TV. It's everywhere. But we are... We are biblically illiterate more so than we've ever been because we let other people tell us what the Bible says instead of going to the Word of God and let God tell me what He says. And the reason we can't uh, see or recognize their fruit is because we are biblically illiterate. Second um, Timothy 4. And they... Who is they? Now, be careful. They are the people that's gone through the wide gate. They're traveling the broad way. They're religious people. Watch this. They will turn their ears away from the truth. Remember we talked about all of those things about with regard to the Word of God? And be turned aside. Listen, guys, you can't turn away from truth and get zero. When you turn away from truth, you get the lie. That's what it says. And be turned aside to fables. Next verse. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who were long ago marked out from this condemnation, meaning God knew who they were from eternity. Ungodly men. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here's the, this is the gate. This is the gate that's wide. Who turn the grace of God into lewdness. Which means loose, immoral, perverted living. And in doing so, deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Likewise, also... This is so important. These dreamers, guys, listen to me. The airwaves are filled with people who are having dreams and visions. And they're going all over this country preaching and teaching and writing books about their dreams and visions. And people are coming to believe things about heaven that someone else had a vision of. And they're coming to believe things about God that someone else has had a dream of. But let me tell you something. The Bible says that God... When John was on the Isle of Patmos, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he was caught up into heaven. And the Lord said, come up here. And the the description of heaven by John, the revelator, from the Isle of Patmos into the, the realm of the heavenly realm is the only description of heaven that has the authority of God behind it. Everything else is a dream. Everything else is some man's vision. And when you and I begin to chase people and follow people that are having dreams and visions and I saying, I hear the Lord say, and, and, and all of these things, and, and they're, they're talking about angels and all of that, but they never bring up the gospel. They never bring up the cross. They never bring up repentance. They never bring up holiness. They never bring up righteousness. They never bring up the word of God. But all they preach is a dream and a vision and an angel and an encounter. Run! 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 Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Who are dignitaries? Those are angelic hosts of the highest realm. And it says these people are so wrapped up in their own mind that they speak blasphemously of Satan. Watch the next. I don't think I put this. But these speak evil. There it is. Speak evil of whatever they do not know. They're stupid. Talking about stuff they don't know. And whatever they know naturally, meaning by their own understanding, like brute beasts in these things, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They're jealous people. 
run greedily in the way of Balaam for profit, meaning they preach and try to get your money to pad their pockets and perish in the rebellion of Korah. They reject authority. Jealousy, greed, and reject authority. These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up on, by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Verse 16. Here we go. These are grumblers and complainers walking according to their own lust and they mouth great swelling words flattering people to what? And what do you have that they want? Your attention, your adoration, your money. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last days who would walk according to their own godly lust. These are sensual persons. That means they live according to their own lustful spirits who cause divisions. Watch this now. Not having the spirit. Lastly, when you have a false gospel and a false prophet, what are you going to end up with? Verse 21, false convert. False convert. Notice it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who what? Who does the will of my Father in heaven. What do you mean? goes back to the teaching of James. Faith without works is dead. Your works don't save you, but your, your works are evident that your faith is legit. It's a, it's a faith that changes your life. Listen, if you, if you profess to be a Christian and your life has not changed outside of just going to church, it's a red flag. It's just a red flag. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sleeping in the carport makes you a Volkswagen. All right? There has to be a corresponding work of the Spirit. If there was a work of its, its, the Spirit in regeneration, there's going to be a work of the Spirit in sanctification. And if, there's, if you are claiming a faith that has not changed your life, chances are you have a vain faith. You are disqualified in the faith. They are religious. Look, it says, for many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? They have religious activity. But look at what he says to them. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, which would be bad enough. I never knew you. He says, depart from me, you who, watch this now, here's the, here's the key two words, practice lawlessness. Practice lawlessness means a lifestyle lived intentionally outside the parameters of Scripture. Yet, they called Jesus Lord, and yet they had the expectation that they were going to be welcomed into heaven. You go, how did that happen? They fell for the, the hook of a false gospel that came out of the mouth of a greedy false prophet. And they walked abroad way that was easy with no sacrifice with no with no adherence no no inclination to obey God no inclination to obey his word yet they had every they had the testimony that they were Christian to the people around them I'm just try, I'm just trying to say guys listen to me Everyone in this room has some sort of problem in their life. Money, health, family, friends, jobs, you name it. Everyone has problems. You don't have any problems. You don't have any problems compared to what you're going to have in eternity. There is nothing you're going through. There's nothing that you lack. Nothing has been done to you 
like what you're going to experience in eternity without Christ. I hope and pray that God would minister to you in the midst of where you are, that he would heal you in your sickness, deliver you in your addiction, calm your fears, give you a spirit of peace, give you joy in the, in the middle of the storm. But listen, but if nothing changes in your life, the destination of eternity trumps everything. It trumps everything. And you and I have got to go back to this word. And we've got to be, we've got to see whether or not we be truly in the faith. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you that the majority of people on this earth are going to die without Christ. That is according to God's word, not Randy Fuller being a prophet. That's according to God's word. And most of the people that are inside the walls of the churches of America today are going to go to hell. Period. Not because the truth is not available, but because men have turned aside to faith. Trying to find an answer to their marriage instead of an answer for their soul. You can't counsel lost people into the kingdom. You must repent and be born again. You can't counsel people into the joy of the Lord. You can't counsel people into the peace of God. You can't counsel people into holiness and righteousness. They must be born again. They must be saved.